Her Excellency uh, Fatuma, uh, Fatumata Jallo is uh, with us today. Um, uh, her political career in Gambia started back in the 90s. Uh, she served as the Vice President of the Republic of Gambia, the Minister of Health, Social Welfare and Women's Affairs, uh, Policy Advisor on Women uh, to three successive presidents of Gambia, uh, was the chairperson of the National Women's Council and the Women's Representative to the Gambia National uh, Economic and Social Council, and uh, uh, all under the leadership of the first president of the Republic of Gambia. Uh, she also played a, a uh, incredible role uh, in establishing a uh, unprecedented coalition of uh, opposition political parties uh, in Gambia uniting uh, the government. Um, I know I cannot do as great as an uh, introduction as you can for yourself. So um, if you could share with our audience uh, today um, some issues in the, within the African Union that you, you're very, very passionate about, uh, uh, Your Excellency. First of all, I thank God Almighty for giving us this uh, great opportunity. I'm really happy and uh, honored to be part of uh, Peaceful Minds um, at the initiative of Professor. And um, I also most grateful for the fact that um, the organization has included the, the women, prominent women uh, in, in championing the cause of mental health. Uh, by way of introduction, if we've done it well, but I started my career at the age of 16 when I became a bride wife when young, at the age of 16, I was married off after just high school and um, became just a full housewife and then got children. Uh, I say this because mostly uh, they feel that motherhood is not a career. It is a career, 24 seven career. It's more of a challenging career than any of his career. So I've, I'm a mother of eight children, four boys and four girls. And then uh, my professional career started um, in the 80s, 1980, when I joined uh, the United Nations Development Program as a program assistant. And then I raised to the capacity of policy advisor. Just as I'm saying, as a mother, I, <laughs> My children are going away for a weekend and I was just trying to give them something. Anyway, um, I became a person program assistant in the United Nations Development Program. And I raised up to the, to the chief technical advisor on policy and uh, women and gender affairs uh, development uh, practitioner and uh, in and out of government from 1994 when we had a change of government through a coup d'etat, I was one of the nationals that was uh, uh, chosen, um, not by way of anything, but perhaps by way of recognition uh, by the, my country to help uh, return the country, to contribute to returning the country to democratic rule. Uh, but I stayed just for seven, seven months uh, because it wasn't going in the right direction and as by way of principle and the oath I took on my Holy Quran, I didn't think it was important and it was right. And be the Minister of Health, Social Welfare and Women's Affairs to be there and see injustices being inflicted on the on society as a whole. So I had to leave. I went back to the UN um, for, 12, for again for 12 years, um, New York, Liberia, many other countries, including the Great Lakes. And then I came back for the struggle uh, had to leave the UN, lucrative job, to come back and help my country to really uproot the dictator of 22 years who's been here and has been characterized by naming and uh, dis disappearances, uh, disappearing people, killing, raping, and whatever, all the atrocities, human atrocities you can imagine. I thought I had a role and responsibility to come back to my country to contribute to the struggle. Unfortunately, I was in the forefront of the struggle. I was the chair, I am the chair of the National Coalition, which, which comprises seven political parties, three civil society organizations uh, that ousted the dictator 
Uh, we had a change of regime. And then I became vice president, uh, not because of what I did, perhaps what I did, but by, by way of competence. I believe in competence. I don't want to work with any, anywhere, no matter what you give me, billions of dollars. If I cannot contribute, I cannot make a difference. I really don't, don't take those type of jobs because I have a conscience and I always want my conscience to be clear. Now, after my stint, the reason why I also left, because it's important for people to know, is the fact that it's on political reasons. I think they think um, I was too straight, straightforward to be uh, the vice president. We had a change of regime and our challenge is governance. Changing regime doesn't mean automatically governance. We, I think we had the oath to really take Gambia forward and not anything else. So when I decided I found myself real uncomfortable in that situation, I prayed to God Almighty to do the best for me and I was removed from power because of political reasons. Nonetheless, I still remain relevant to my country. Uh, most probably I, I have uh, political ambitions not because of uh, vengeance, but because I think my, I, my country needs me. I have the competence and the means and connections that are, that, is, that are required to really be there as a role model for women. Um, now, during my past time, I've been doing consultancies in development, in peace building, uh, reconciliation and so forth. And a doctor approached me and I, am, I said, well, Mental health is something that is everybody's business. Just as human rights is everybody's business, mental health is everybody's business because I may be well today, relatively think that I'm, I'm well, but perhaps uh, medically or maybe some other how, if I, uh, if I am really diagnosed by a competent person, I might have some ailments here and there. Uh, it's not medically, but also psychology, psychological and social also. So I decided, I think, well, this is an organization in which I see myself serving uh, humanity. And um, that's so far uh, what I can say by way of uh, introduction. And I'm sorry if I have taken a little bit longer. Uh, no, no. Uh, thank you so much. And I really want to uh, commend you on the national struggle. Uh, that you've certainly been through. And uh, I, you're absolutely right. It's, it's really important to uh, take such uh, issues um, beyond the national scope uh, and internationally, uh, uh, continent-wise and around the world. Um, now, I do uh, want to ask you, you've, um, you participated a lot in regards to um, policy for the African Union. Um, what kind of public health policies uh, would you like to see uh, getting pushed within the African Union? Yes, actually, I missed out your point on the how I see the African Union and the role I could play. Um, I had applied to be a deputy a vice chairman um, of the African Union. Um, unfortunately, because of um, Political reasons again. Um, the subregion, the African West African subregion, decided to give the vice chairmanship to Rwanda, to to not to Rwanda, to give it to Nigeria for peace and security. I, I guess because it is um, because peace and security seem to be really the burning issue in in West Africa here, especially in the sub sub Sahel in the Sahel region. Um, nonetheless, I, I would, my vision would have been really to champion the cause of the African Union that is pushing the agenda, which ranges from peace and security, uh, human rights, um, public health, um, health in general, um, solidarity, um, like the African Renaissance in making Africa be driven by Africans in consultation with their partners, development partners and so forth. And in the area of public health, I think um, it is on the agenda, but my personal viewpoint and professional viewpoint, and I stand to be corrected because it is going to be on the social media, is the fact that uh, not much is done. And I believe that 
they need to do a lot about it. One, if you look at it, the unemployment rate, the, how many Africa today is, how many billions of people population, population wise is over a quarter of the world. And 65% uh, of that population is young people. Young people uh, really don't have the opportunities. They don't access much opportunities. Whereas the agenda says the empowerment of women and youth, little is done in the way of empowering women and youth. And the youth today are the future leaders. They are the resources, they are the assets that we have, but we are leaving them behind. Uh, when we say uh, in the United Nations, the agenda 2030 is saying leaving no one behind. African Union is saying leaving no one behind. EU is saying leaving no one behind, but we are leaving the most important people behind as young people. By way of uh, analysis, employment rate is really increasing. Um, migration is increasing. Uh, people are not looking at the, the fundamental reasons of migration. They are looking this, at the symptomatic reasons of migration. For me, the root cause of migration is lack of opportunities of our young people. They have no opportunities in their countries, if not limited opportunities. They could have been built, their capacities could be built in terms of entrepreneurship. If you go to India, Asia, you go to China, the driving force in Singapore, Paul, in Malaysia, in, in Rwanda, is an African country, but if you, they are models in terms of supporting the empowerment of women and, children and youth. They have opportunities to build their capacity in entrepreneurship because Africa is saying we want the CFT, which is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, they want Africa to be a, a key player in the global economy. They want Africa to really to, to work within themselves to build their resources, to increase their resources, their human capacities, and to really uh, create that prosperity that is required for African people, populations, and, and people who live in Africa. Yet the strategies are really not. Uh, those strategies that for me in my humble mind would, uh, would think would work because not much resources, first of all, not much resources, financial resources are invested in that. And Africa is still dependent. We are still dependent, always putting the right hand out, asking for more rather than looking at what we have. We have so many things, so many resources. For instance, Nigeria can take care of Gambia in terms of resources, human resources, material resources. Even in Gambia today, we have resources. If you look at our, we, we are called the Smiling Coast. We have a long stretch of river, we have the ocean, we have uh, on tap resources uh, that are now being exploited. That alone, we also have the human capital. Gambia is 1.8 million people, but if you go to every many international organizations, you find Gambians in key positions. So coming back, I think um, when we talk about policies, policies must be matched with financial and human resources because that is the driving force. You cannot just have rhetoric, you cannot just have policies without matching them. And in terms of coming to public health, again, we're saying that most of our children who go in, who are going to, for this migration, you see, most of them die in the Mediterranean seas. They don't even reach out their goals. And where, why are they leaving? They are leaving because they, are, they have no opportunities because of poverty. You look at Africa, Africa is still poverty. We have said that by 2020, Poverty will be history, but poverty is stuck. We are still living in poverty. So the children who are going for this migration, if they are going to be returned, they need to be returned with skills and uh, opportunities so that when they come, they can benefit their countries. They can have stable minds. Minds need to be stable and we cannot have really healthy minds when, uh, and, and, and mental health when we are so stressed, the world is full of stress. We cannot say that realistically, you cannot be freed from stress, but you can manage stress by having a job, decent job, by having to, to, to the well-being, the well-being, taking care of yourself, doing jobs that you want, helping your community, networking, and building your countries, and at the same time, contributing to, to the global economy. So public health, um, in my mind, 
even though I did not get the job, I'm not, um, not, I'm not uh, disappointed. I think I still uh, can contribute. I, from time to time, when I see issues that uh, to which I can contribute in addressing, I do send my comment one or there, one or two. Um, and also the issue of governance, it comes to governance. Africa has to really give priority to governance. If you look at the rate of corruption in Africa today, as in the world, in Europe, you can everywhere you have corruption, but you can minimize corruption because corruption is denying people to get access to the basic social services like health, mental health. In my country, we don't have any institution that deals with mental health. We have just one small institution, which is like, it's more of crazy people than mental health. When you see mental health, by definition of the WHO, it's the psychosocial well-being of the person. The person being having the ability to know that he's, he or she is a human being. He or she has the mental health, the psychological health, that he, to, to the extent that he can think for himself, he can contribute to his community, and he can, he can also um, enjoy life, because en enjoying life is also fundamental. So I believe that uh, we need to work at not only going beyond talking about mental health, but in my humble mind, I would recommend that we institutionalize mental health, have the right type of institutions, have the right type of uh, capacities that can deal with mental health, having psychologists, psych psychiatrists, having even medical doctors, so that people can be helped in talking about mental issues. Most of these times, people with mental health um, are usually marginalized. Once you, you, you start behaving in a, in a way outside the norm, people think you are crazy, you are mad. And then very few people, and people, families sometimes, they, they, they hide, they hide uh, the people, uh, their family members who are going with, uh, through mental health. Mental health is not craziness, it's just destabilization of the well being of the person. So the option would be to look at, to talk to them to make them, to support them. Just like in my community, when you see people walking in the street and talking, they say, oh, he's crazy. And children run away from him and families hide them. But I try to reach out to them. And sometimes it's just a small thing that they need. Just maybe somebody talking to them, somebody smiling, somebody giving them hope that nothing is, nothing is ever too late. And it's never too, um, you can always make it. And also somebody to give them just sometimes uh, encourage them to go back to school, dropouts. They can go back to school. They can have skills, develop their skills in different areas. And especially, we shouldn't forget it. A healthy nation is a wealthy nation. You must not forget about people who are in, in the condition of mental health or who have mental issues. By way and large, I think um, this humble con um, analysis uh, would resonate with with the global uh, the, with the world at large because you have mental health everywhere and it can catch up with anybody anytime including myself thank you absolutely uh, but as you said you did not uh, get that position as the deputy chairperson but you did highlight some very important uh, key policies uh, while um, uh, while running for that position. Um, if I could, I, I will uh, read them out. Uh, the first one is enhance administration and financial effectiveness, efficiency and responsiveness of the African Union, strengthen the overall operational efficiency of the African Union, effective and timely responses to the development uh, challenges of Africa, and the promotion of partnerships for development. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the uh, four uh, key policies that uh, you put out. Now, if I could ask you, um, how would those policies uh, factor in uh, when trying to improve um, the uh, mental health policies uh, of, uh, of the continent? Um, policies are made by men and they are made in my humble mind 
the goal of policy is to enhance the well-being of people. That's why you have development. Overall, all these policies uh, march towards uh, uh, ensuring the well-being of the African people and, and other citizens of the world. So how do you do that? First of all, you have to operational efficiency in terms of the institution. The institution that is that, that develops the policy must ensure that it has the right type of competency. They have the right uh, type of mind and commitment that is to minimize corruption and spend resources that are mobilized for the purposes intended. Uh, helping member states, the 57 member, 54 member states of the African Union, helping them see the sectors that are, the, that are lagging behind, like the health sector. When you, because when mental health has direct effects on, on the institution, mental, on the health uh, infrastructure. But if you look at um, the operational efficiency in terms of the, at the level would be accountability to, to having required adequate resources of the health sector, having the right type of uh, health infrastructure. Uh, this requires uh, decentralized infrastructure, including the remote areas. Most of our people in Africa, just like in other countries, like in Asia and everywhere, most of the people who matter live in the rural areas. They are the farmers, they are the shakers, they are, they are the electorates. But most times the politicians mainly look out for the votes, but really very few politicians have the intention of building the capacities of the rural people, making them aware of their rights to claim their rights. So sometimes they just give you, it's the carrot and the stick. They give you something that you would always like to be dependent. When it's time for elections, they give you a bag of rice. They give you some money that will not <laughs> take you even for a few months. So they need to have the right infrastructure, right professional personnel, um, health personnel, doctors, uh, dispensers, nurses, who are well-trained, who are well, who are loyal also to the system, who are also well-paid, because that's Africa, that's the problem we have, challenge we have. We have so many systems and processes, but when it comes to really providing incentives for the human capacity, the human capability, it's, it's, my, it's a little less, and this is where corruption comes. If you pay me $50 or $100 a month, if I am not honest, and I see a way of having a second job outside my sector, I will go for it. This is just human nature. So in, in order for us to look at uh, development as an integral part, uh, we need to look at as an overarching process. We need to look at the resources, have right infrastructure, health infrastructure, hospitals, clinics, uh, health posts, have the personnel, and in the national budget, we need to include adequate resources. Um, as a politician and also a policymaker, when I was either in or out, I always championed the cause of uh, the human being because I'm a human being. And for me, my, I want to leave a legacy where I can impact on the lives of other people, not only me and my family. That, that is not important. What is important is ensuring that the communities for whom you have sworn on the Holy Quran or on the Bible to serve, that you serve them and it, that you impact on their lives positively. And that you don't just leave them at that position of vulnerability, always trying, needing and needing and needing for help. You want to empower them. You want to give them the resources. You want to give them opportunities, entrepreneurship. You want to give them uh, businesses, women in business, give them opportunities so that they, by and large, they can also fend for, for their families. They can also spend some resources, some of their resources in educating their children and also some resources to go to access social, basic social services like education, skills, training, and, and, also, um, uh, and also community work. Um, we, while we are talking about challenges, each time we talk about challenges, it's important as policymakers that we have strategic actions, that we be action-oriented, result-oriented. 
that we be accountable in terms of this is the plan we have. Midway, we look at the plan, have what have we achieved, what is left to be achieved, why we have not we have not been able to achieve our, our targets, and uh, the way forward. Action. I think Africa needs to be more action oriented, and it has to start from the political leadership, from the African Union. It goes down, triggers down to the African level of the national, uh, the country specifics. Uh, where, for instance, today we are talking about COVID. Can you imagine? Even COVID is impacting even those who ha uh, don't have mental health. Not much those who have mental health. Uh, income is declining. Infrastructure, agriculture, for instance, is the backbone of Africa as it is of other countries. But today agriculture is not much is resources you have in agriculture. And uh, agriculture is predominantly where you have the rural people. 70% of people who produce the goods and services for us to be fed in the urban area. So you also the businesses are not working, it's impacting on businesses. Uh, some countries are doing well like Rwanda and other countries that are giving incentives to businesses so that uh, they can maintain uh, the, not the level of business, but at least they can keep on, uh, they, they, they can be, active in, in business in tandem with these uh, challenges is how can political leaders, citizens also, civil society organizations, NGOs be involved in curbing corruption? I am a realistic person. I don't think ever will eradicate corruption from the world. <laughs> and this is not only Africa, it's everywhere. But you can minimize corruption minimized by having the pol right policies, by having political commitment, by having people who are competent enough to ensure that they know what the negative impact of corruption, that they can really relate to the underdevelopment. Why are we underdeveloped in the 21st century? We need to look at all those things in tandem. So mental health is not, uh, is, is shouldn't be considered in isolation with other, uh, other the challenges in Africa? Um, I, I agree. Um, I think some changes to uh, social welfare, as well as uh, opportunities, jobs, and just a relief on the stress on uh, survival uh, will really help uh, people focus more on uh, their health. Um, I think that needs to be on the uh, front line uh, in, in, in policy making, uh, that sort of uh, goal and motivation. Now, uh, with these policies, I would like to ask you, uh, what can Africans expect from their countries and from the African Union, uh, do you think, uh, within the next 15 years? Um. I think 15 years is too much. If we give ourselves 15 years, there may be complacency. But it's important that every five years uh, or every three years, you have this uh, heads of state summit every year on an annual basis. I know the COVID has been constraining and now we are using more of technology, which is also positive because it would urge everybody <laughs> to be technologically uh, literate. Uh, the world is driven by technology and particularly political leaders must also ensure that they have time to, to, be, uh, to be exposed to these skills. Um, we believe that um, in my mind, I, I think we need to um, take, for instance, five years and say, uh, where are we on development as an agenda, African agenda? In the countries, we have national development plans. Where are we on here in terms of education, quality education, affordable education? Where are we in having our people, empowering our people by providing them with opportunities? Where are we on the youth? What are we doing with the youth? Do we send them back to school to really create vocational training skills? to have more skills so that you can widen their options. You know, life is a choice. You need to give people choices. And then you also need to look at the women. 
having including women in governance is very important. Uh, women in governance, my experience, not because I'm a woman, but that's the experience I have uh, learned over the years. Women are very focused. And women, when they say, this is my target, this is my target. I want to have, for instance, in the next five years, I want to have so many people, like when I was the vice president, we have a national development plan that is talking about empowerment of women and youth. We're talking about quality education, talking about agriculture, talking about fisheries, the productive sectors of the economy. Now, my responsibility as, or as was uh, coordinator of government business, I ensured that there was all the time uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring the performance of the institutions, uh, including ministries, state-owned um, enterprises, and uh, also even NGOs I opened up because government is not supposed to be involved in implementing programs. The responsibility of government is to ensure that there is the enabling environment in terms of legislature, in terms of also um, policies, the right policies. But it is the NGO civil society that should be given, be empowered and be supported to, to implement the programs that are developed, that are derived from uh, the policies. For instance, if they say water and sanitation, you have NGOs that are involved in water and sanitation. You, they have their projects, well-defined projects. You, you support them to do, to do that, supporting civil society. Rather than seeing NGOs and civil society as adversaries, they should be seen as partners in development. That way they work in tandem in implementing the policies creating that type of amicable environment. Um, if you also look at the, the issue of uh, um, uh, businesses, you know, when we're talking about all these things that we're doing, government cannot do everything. So once you have the policy, for instance, in mental health, we say, my target today is to have an institution that deals with mental health, not to have it as an appendix, but to have a separate institution that will con be confined solely on looking at ensuring that the nation is he healthy by way of giving them opportunities to enjoy life, to, to, to maximize uh, their capacities as human beings, by way of also networking, having Asians coming to help Africa, Africa, Asia, that network, global partnership, because no one is able to do everything. There are so many. Uh, there are so many experts. Africa has so many experts that they can interchange between between the countries. But where they are lacking, where they have a gap, they can bring in other partners to help them. And uh, my experience is that also the diaspora is very important. The diaspora is also a big when it comes to really like practically in our struggle for 22 years. They have, it's about today, as of today, it's about 50 something billion Gambian dollars is currency that they have contributed by way of foreign direct investment, giving their, not only to taking care of their parents, but also investing in, Af in, in, in Gambia. So the diaspora, but most times politicians will cry for the diaspora, diaspora. <laughs> Once they, we, we sit, we are comfortable. We forget about the diaspora. We need to have look at the constitution where there is no provision for that. We can amend the constitution, include the participation of the diaspora in governance, even allocate certain quota, have a quota system where you can have youth, women, and the diaspora participate in, in, in the legislature, in government, in, in also in the private sector. The private sector is also something that can play a crucial role in mental health. Because when they have resources and they have good direction from government, a good vision, a good political leadership with competence, vision, they could direct some of their resources through social corporate responsibility. They could support government in perhaps uh, building a hospital and then government can give them doctors and give them other personnel. And they can even support at some point with the cooperation of the international community, they can support uh, the payment of personnel, 
provision of equipment for a certain period until the government can stand on its own to as absorb that capacity. The responsibility of financing development, including mental health, which is fundamental. Without help, without a good mental health, you are really, a, you are even earning sin because you are depriving people from their capacities, from the capacities that God had created them. You are depriving them from, from being happy. You are depriving them from being able to be independent. You are depriving them from contributing to their communities. And the youth today, we should not underestimate them. Whether they are well-educated or half-educated, they know their rights. And you can see the, 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 around the world that they are no longer sitting and just waiting on government to do something. They challenge governments. They, sometimes the way they challenge government as a mother, I always, uh, and also as a politician, but also making, wanting to make a difference, I always tell them, I say, look, you can challenge government, but there's a way you do it. You need to write petitions. You need to know, first of all, what you want government to do. The responsibility, you have to know the responsibility of government. Then you need to write, you have your own strategy. You need to write petition. You need to engage go uh, governments, sit with them and dialogue. Because today, the context in the Gambia is peace and reconciliation. For 22 years, families have been divided. Most times in the world, families are divided because of politics, because of love, peace and instability, because of conflict and instability. So I always say they need to know what they do. They need to have strategies and they need to also participate. Rather than always complaining, they should be part of the solutions. They're not part of the problem. The problem should be somewhere identified as a national issue. But when it comes to solutions, try to be to be to, to work together, to be cohesive. Uh, that is the other challenge that we have. The reason why so many people go into mental uh, trauma and that sort of is that because they are quiet, they don't want to be part of it, and uh, or they feel they don't have that self-esteem. Uh, they always see themselves as a well. Um, let them do it, and in the end, they go into more stress and more other psychosocial issues to the point that it takes them to another level of losing their minds. So if we take, I believe, if we take development as a pillar, as, an, as a goal in the African Union, as in any organization, ensuring the well-being of everybody, ensuring everyone and ensuring that nobody, no one is left behind, then we will really get the things right not 100% because if everything is perfect and then there is no work. So, but at least uh, being happy as an officer, as, as a responsible uh, person, citizen, ensuring that right strategies are adopted to ensure that uh, mental health and other issues, poverty, but social exclusion uh, and uh, migration, uh, internally displaced people, refugee situation uh, can be contained. Because if you look at also analytically, statistically, you find that most of, uh, almost the, 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 the population in migration and, and refugee situation in Africa is, is not decreasing, it's increasing. Each time there is peace, one foot forward, the other two feet uh, backward. So we also looked at in the totality and ensure that we have an environment, peaceful environment, where youth would stay home, work, contribute, become leaders of tomorrow, and also have an intergenerational dialogue. We need to have an intergenerational dialogue. You see people who are old and yet they don't want to retire. You can retire and become an advisor or retire and create your own NGO or retire and do community work. It's not, uh, it's not uh, right for me to really be at the age of 80. And, 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 and occupying a position that four or six or seven youth, youth can occupy, learn and move the country forward.
Absolutely, I, I really agree that youth have a big part to play uh, with this, uh, including uh, NGOs and, and, and the people uh, with power. Uh, we could really do uh, a lot of change. We can really enact a lot of change. And that's why uh, we hold uh, these events. And um, diaspora is also a whole other topic that's, that's really important. I do uh, remember uh, you speaking about it in Geneva. Um, I think it's, it's, it's just a whole thing uh, that needs to be factored in uh, along with the, any policy that is uh, made uh, within Africa. Uh, now, uh, before I get to my la very last question, I'd like to invite anyone um, who would like to ask a question uh, to uh, Her Excellency uh, Fatumata Jallo, uh, former Vice President of Gambia. If anyone would like to ask a question, you can do so now and we'll get to it at uh, the end of the program. Now, uh, my last question, it's about the African Women Innovation and Entrepreneurship uh, Forum. Um, you were uh, a big part of uh, uh, creating this uh, forum to help women uh, find opportunities and create opportunities. Um, now, as you spoke before, the opportunities is a uh, massive part of helping people with their mental health. Um, how, how, what kind of uh, progress had this, has this forum has and what kind of uh, things would you like to see this forum to achieve uh, in, in terms of uh, mental health for women and, and their opportunities? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of the Gambia Women's Finance Association, which is a microfinancing organization. Uh, which was created by us, the founder members, 11 women in 1987. And I'm also uh, a member of many other organizations at the international, African and continental and international level. And um, my uh, way of seeing things is the, the fact that mental health until recently has been something that is not talked about much and it's not considered in policy. And it's not, uh, it's not, it's not a resource, it's not sourced uh, financially um, and materially also. So my way of seeing things as uh, one of the leaders of this organization, uh, Peaceful Minds is to ensure that every organization that I belong to would uh, have a window of uh, contribution to improving mental health and to ensuring ending mental health, mental health issues. Um, if you're talking about microfinance, uh, so the corporate social corporate responsibility of my organization, you can, you can contribute if there is an institution that is dealing with mental health, we can, we can by way of maybe contributing equipment and looking at you know, through a, a, a weakness, strength and weakness analysis, we can look at where the gaps are and then see how we can buy, uh, contribute in kind uh, towards that. Uh, in, in, even if it means just uh, giving them contacts of other people who are willing to come as volunteers. You can have people in different countries who are willing to, to volunteer, have a, full, a volunteer program. And that is also a culture that I definitely, uh, I have always promoted as a development practitioner. Um, we need to create that culture of voluntarism. Uh, not every time you work, you have to be paid. Sometimes what you get, the reward you get in just volunteering, in terms of experience, in terms of exposure, in terms of networking, can really build your life in another, in a different way, in a, in a way that you don't even understand. So by way of strategic uh, thinking, I am, that's my thinking, by way of action, that is what I'm going to champion, that uh, there are NGOs that are responsible, not only government that are responsible for, for helping, supporting mental health, people with mental health, but not in the broader sense of mental health. For them, it's only when they see somebody they call crazy, mad, yes. And here, mostly what we do in Africa, we take, the, take them to traditional healers. Uh, traditional healers, I, I have known, even members of my family who had mental health issues, and they were healed by uh, traditional healers. But if you look at that, 
is because of they, 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 they have a strategy. They have a strategy of not only talking to the person, but they diagnose. They, they want to know what the problems, they identify the problems and they work towards work with the patient in, 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 in really addressing the mental health issue. So the mental health, we need to also look at how government policy should open up to traditional healing. Because I know there are so many people who are gifted who are doing traditional. So if you if you marry the two conventional and traditional, it could be, have more effect on that. Then the other NGOs that are in the area of helping those who are really have lost their minds, we can also educate them. You know, we can create uh, educational opportunities, sensitization opportunities, bringing you know, advising the cause of mental health. It is something that is lacking in Africa. So now my really, my, my strategy is to really champion the cause of mental health, bringing it in the social media. Mental health can be, can, is everybody's business. It's just like human rights is everybody's business. We need to support them. They are our families, they are our friends, our relatives. So we need to support them and we need to understand first of all, what is mental health, you know? We need to understand that mental health is not just being crazy, losing your mind, but it's, it's the absence of uh, fundamental rights that a human being is supposed to have. That is uh, a job, well, well paid job, not public, private, or whatever. That is also um, opportunities in terms of financing and support. That is also education, skills development. Uh, that's also volunteerism, uh, being ambassadors for mental health. Uh, that's also networking, you know, all that gamut of elements that can build the capacities of societies to understand and appreciate that mental health is really seeping, increasing also in our societies. And if we don't mind, especially among young people who are going to, who are our assets and future leaders, we are losing a, a really, really, really critical uh, capacity in, in development. Um, thank you uh, so much, uh, Your Excellency. And uh, if you don't mind, we do have one question from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, does Her Excellency uh, reckon, uh, oh, questions from Samir, uh, does the, Her Excellency reckon a, secularized, a secularization of Gambia would open lucrative opportunities for foreign investors as that would improve the perception of Gambia globally and lead to more job opportunities through building infrastructure, thus improving the total welfare and mental stability of Gambian citizens. Uh, that is a sensitive question that is being addressed in my country and I wouldn't like to comment on it because it's still on the uh, discussion. Uh, it has political and social sensitivity, religious sensitivity. So I would not leave it. I would just leave it at that. Uh, sure. But for me, what I can say um, as a professional and also as a, a religious uh, practitioner, I would say, um, I, I would believe that uh, Europe and other countries would have to respect the socio-economic, the cultural context of countries. Uh, it is not uh, because you want me to go one direction as many Western countries are saying, they want to define democracy for us. They want to define what the good governance is in their own countries, where is the good governance? We have seen, we have seen America with Trump. Is that good governance? We have seen many, many countries uh, with, with, uh, with, 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 with bad governance. So we, I think the respect for the sovereignty of countries is fundamental. Leave countries as they are, not everybody's imagining civilization is coming. Civilization comes, starts from Africa. We science, mathematics, all this is from the religion, all the religious uh, holy books, especially the Holy Quran. You go to Egypt, it's the cradle of civilization. So there's nothing that they can teach us that we don't know. But because the world is going, the majority of the world is going secular or non-secular, 
they want all countries to be the same. That cannot happen. They have to respect the sovereignty because the, the people who define their context, who define their, their society. There is nothing alien that you can bring by way of because we have resources, we have the financial resources. Those resources that they are talking with me, and I need to talk about this. Even the international communities, partners that are funding, helping us, supporting us, they must look at again the way of funding. We have to have a new thinking of uh, bilateral cooperation, multilateral co cooperation. Uh, we don't have, to, we, we, we can't continue to be top bottom. As a development practitioner, it has to be bottom top. It is the needs and aspirations of the people that should drive the type of assistance we are looking from the donors. So if they want to support us, and besides the most important point is the fact that the resources they have, the World Bank and the IMF, they get those resources in the name of our countries. If they want to support Gambia, they go round table conference, they say, we want to support Gambia. And everybody who wants to support Gambia comes through them. Now, with good governance, Tanzania has shown it, that it can do it on its own, on her own. The, the, the John Makafuli who passed away, may he so rest in perfect peace, yeah, yeah, Allah, I mean, uh, he, he, he showed an example. Rwanda, Paul Kagame is showing an example. Makisal of Senegal is showing an example that they can do, Africa can do it on their own. If they start really thinking and maximizing their resources, their human resources, their, 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 their material resources, and understanding that these donors come for these resources. You go to Congo, this cell phone, everything that is listing of the, the elements of the cell phone, Congo, go to Congo, go to Brazzaville, you go anywhere. They can take our resources. So what we need to, we need to rethink, transform, the political thinking must transform its minds, have a set mind, mental setup that we can do it. Let us try to have build factories. Let us try to have uh, the value addition of the products we have, our raw products. So that instead of taking, exporting, raw products and then buying the finished goods. Uh, we, we, we create jobs for our people and creating jobs will allow you to, would give you the option to really say that, yeah, this is my priority. Mental health is my priority because I need to have a wealthy nation. I will to need to, an African citizen, citizens were health before I go for development. What is development? The well-being of people. If those people are not well, how can you ensure the well-being of their well-being? So my, my advice is that Africa must really try to safeguard its resources. The resources are not for them today, not for our generation, but other, other generations to come. If the people who were here did not manage the resources properly, if they gave everything to Europe, like France is saying now, um, they, they're trying to have the CFA, one uh, francophone, uh, currency, but yet they say France must be the custodian of the, of, the, of the treasury. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. And it's mostly it is the women. When women think, we think critically. We, because from the home, from the house, that's what I started as a mother. I was a career from, from, from being a parent, a mother and a wife. You give us $5, you come home, you can eat more than $5. When a child has a mental health, it is the burden of the mother. It is the mother who talks to the child. It is the mother who takes all the burden. Actually, what happens in Africa, when your child has mental health, they say, oh, it's the work of the mother. The mother is either a witch or the mother did bad or did that. Everything, the blame is on the mother, on the mother, on the mother. So the mother has not only to take care of the children, take care of the husband, make sure that he's well-fed, well-dressed, well-respected uh, in society. So the, the crux of the matter is that we have to transform the modality mode, modality of cooperation, international cooperation. The World Bank, yes, the IMF, yes, but they must only come when they are needed. And when they come, the political agenda should be the influence and the driving force of the cooperation, not because of what they want. And because when they come, they come with their experts, so-called experts. You pay one expert, 
$500,000 a year when you could have paid uh, $1,000 to a national to do the job better than them. I was in the international community. When consultants came, I did all the job. I did all the job, just like my colleagues nationally, they do all the job, the ground job. They just come and put, within three days, they put up the report and put their name on it, name organization. They sell that report and, and come back with the money, bring their experts while you, your, your country is crying for uh, underemployment. They're crying for our children going in the street because of mental health issues and sometimes suicide. Sometimes it pushes those who have mental issues if they don't have the right support, so, uh, psychosocial support, they go, they, they go to su su suicidal, they become suicidal. So uh, we need to have critical thinkers. We need to have people who are committed. We need to have people who are honest in, in leadership. We need to have people who want to leave a legacy, a bright future for Africa, and particularly for young women, for, for women and, and, and young people. So I think this organization is a very important organization. I really thank uh, uh, Professor Kapoor for coming up with uh, such a brilliant organization. I thank you all for being team members and I'm also honored and really gratified to be part of it. I will not, as I always say, one person cannot have all the solutions to any one problem. But I guess that with time and time, with my age, I'm still learning and I will continue to learn until the day I go to my grave. Why am I still learning? I want to be influential. I want to be heard. I want to support my community. I want to support society. I want for, to contribute to Africa's advancement. I want to co contribute to world peace because peace as uh, Nelson Mandela says, it's not the absence of war. It's not the, the, the use of uh, conflicts, fighting and, and killing and that sort of thing. Uh, it's deprivation, social exclusion. Uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, lack of uh, opportunities. All these are things that really uh, affects people. Either we know it, and of course, in, we, my word, final word is that mental health when you have somebody with mental health in your home, gradually you also, in a way, you also have mental health because the pressure on you, especially as mothers and sisters, the pressure, you have double pressure, already you have your individual pressure. Then you have somebody who is not, who is part and parcel of you that you cannot avoid and that you cannot, uh, you cannot, you cannot drive out of the home because he has mental health. So uh, gradually, gradually, you also become ill. By way of you know, some people, this is high blood pressure. I'm not a doctor, but by experience, you see people going to high blood pressure, diabetes, all the time, ailments and so forth. It's because of the pressure. So we must look at mental health as a collective responsibility, not only Africa, but the world at large. Absolutely. We do need to, uh, we do need to, really broaden uh, our horizons and, and, and the discussions uh, all over the world. And uh, thank you so much uh, for being with us, for having this great informative and inspirational discussion with us. Uh, it, it, it is an incredible honor. Um, uh, and, and absolutely, yes, I, I think, uh, I really thank uh, Dr. Nabit Kapoor, uh, founder and president of the Peaceful Mind Foundation for uh, being able to uh, facilitate this for us. Um, unfortunately, uh, we, due to time constraints, we will not be able to uh, answer uh, further uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, so uh, if anybody has any questions or concerns, I've emailed uh, my, e I've, I've uh, put my email into the uh, discussion uh, part and as well as Tanvi's email. If you do not, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, please direct it to us. We would love to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for joining us. We hope that we can uh, host you again. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Kapoor for being able to facilitate this for us. And uh, thank you to uh, Tamvi for uh, assisting me in um, uh, 
for for assisting me in 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 hosting this um, today. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank our audience uh, for joining us, and I really hope that you could join us for uh, further sessions. Uh, we will post. Uh, we'll continue to post uh, events in the future. They will all be free, and uh, we really hope that all of you uh, could join us in our uh, future uh, sessions. Um, so uh, thank you so much. Um, I am uh, Zekri Abdelmoumen, joining you from Istanbul. Uh, on behalf of the Peaceful Mind Foundation, I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and we hope that you enjoyed it and that you will join us again soon. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I hope that you have a splendid uh, rest of your day and uh, your weekend. Thank you so much, Samir. Uh, as I say, it's always an honor and pleasure to be part of this uh, Peaceful Mind organization. I thank uh, Professor Kapoor and you and his team and everyone member of the organization. I will be willing and make myself available for whatever questions you have and whatever dialogue and particularly dialogue and also networking that you feel like and to which you feel like can be of, of benefit. So thank you so much. I, I, as a prayerful person, I pray that God blesses this uh, organization and that it be replicated uh, worldwide and also that it goes beyond uh, just uh, having webinars and, and, and seminars and other sessions, but also it goes to institutionalizing the organization in many countries by having the right infrastructure for, to, to benefit the, the increasing uh, populations that are affected by mental health. God bless you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Bye for now. Have a nice weekend. And Me give too. my greetings to Professor Kapoor. Of course. Thank you.